Well, if you have a, a country that has uh, a history of non-stable government over long periods of time, which is what we seem to be saying here, um, and you also have um, a country that has high rates of illiteracy, um, mm. you know, the men do meet, but you're saying, you said earlier that the women don't get an education. So that's mm -hmm. half your population that doesn't get any education at all, and, that, and those that do, uh, as far as the men, are not very high. Mm -hmm. How do you even build a government in an area where you have those kinds of problems. I mean, are, are there any sort of templates that we can look at where this has been even remotely successful before? I think we have to use what they're familiar with. I, I think we can't impose something new. Okay. So we have to use the councils that are there and work with them. We have to be flexible enough to take what they're used to, their traditions, and mold it into something that can be effective for them. It may not be the best thing for us or another country, but it will work for them. I think one of the problems we have there right now is that so many people don't trust them, that the government is so corrupt that it is, they don't trust the people in charge. And when you lack a centralized trust, people go to their local leaders. And based on economics, their loyalties will fluctuate. Mm -hmm. That's very true from what I, the, the reports that I'm hearing as well, is when Hamid Karzai was on the, uh, uh, the trail seeking the presidency, which he was already president, but he didn't really appeal to the people as, to vote for him as much as he appealed to the head man, the individual, that get your people to vote for me and what's implied is you'll get your kickbacks kind of stuff. And we know that there were literally hundreds of thousands of uh, odd votes that didn't mm -hmm. fit in that election. They had a recall election and only the uh, only then did the com his competition just say I'm done with it. And so you get to be president again because I'm tired of messing with it. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned illiteracy rates. I think they range from 30% uh, of the female population to 60% uh, of the male population is literate. But wow, I mean you're starting from just very most basic things. Um, but again with the schools giving these people, uh, uh, thinking about Greg Mortensen's three cups of tea. Um, he was initially building schools in northern Pakistan. Um, now he's stretched and built maybe 15 to 20 schools in, in Afghanistan in remote regions. And we, these people are happy to have them. There's a key here um, that those militants would go through and destroy the schools if they were built with someone else's funds. But if those individuals, given the money, built them their, themselves, they risk cutting their support by destroying the schools that were built by those people in that area who wanted the school for not only their boys but their girls as well. Um, so that is, it's a slow process for sure. I don't know, when we think about it, it what do we really want out of this? I guess it's just a non-safe haven for Al-Qaeda and don't attack us again and we'll forget about you. I don't know, I, I'm not yeah, sure that, what that happens the, in the end. The, the military goal here is, is very confusing. Um, if it's just to seek out Al-Qaeda and, and destroy them as a, a viable terrorist group, the danger is once we do that, we could simply leave. And then Afghanistan will fall back into its typical pattern, mm. which in these very remote regions become safe havens one again, once again for these very radical groups. Um, you know, what is our goal? And, and I think that was something that was missing in Iraq early on. What is the goal? Give them freedom? Well, what does that mean? They were relatively free prior to Saddam Hussein in some general sense. Most people in this, this region, what they want is the electricity to work, the heat to work, water supply, and war has a way of not providing those things with the best intentions. We, you know, we try not to destroy things, but you know, there were reports in Iraq that some people said, well, you know, things were better under Saddam Hussein because at least the lights worked, <laughs> right? Um, it, it's going to be a, a transition that we have to couple the military aspect with assisting them with what they need from building a bridge to helping their water supply. Um, and, and it's difficult. As, as bad as the Taliban was in our estimation uh, in, in the mid to late 1990s after they gained control, people were pretty happy to have them simply because it provided peace and stability. They had beaten off uh, the, 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 the warlords who continued to squabble over stuff, the corruption in the government. Um, different things allowed them to uh, come gain, you know, gain uh, support of the people there. Only later, of course, when that, real quick, by them, 
giving aid and comfort to uh, Al-Qaeda, just for a minute. It's not to be uh, uh, apologized for what, what they did, or it's just meant to explain. But there is, uh, in the Muslim context, uh, uh, I don't know if it applies the actual word here, but it's called Bessa um, in certain parts of the Islamic world, where not only if you came and asked them for shelter, for food, for protection, they would give you all of that. And one more thing, that, that you asked for it, I would lay down my life for you. That is part of our culture that's ingrained. It seemed like a very simple thing that they would give up Osama bin Laden when we asked for him, mm -hmm. and they didn't give him up, and that really befuddled. Why would you do that? But to go against our culture, and money doesn't mean that much to some of these idealistic people, $20 million or whatever has been on his head for years now. They surely know where he is, but they're not giving him up. So the culture is something you're going to have to work around. The culture is a big part of the problem here, right? How do we, well, maybe I should ask this another way. <clears throat> is it reasonable, given what we have seen from uh, President Obama's plan that he laid out um, earlier this month, uh, and even from what uh, General McChrystal recently said, can we accomplish this by July 2011 before we start pulling troops out? Now, General McChrystal has said, we'll stay until the job is finished, but we start pulling people out in July 2011. That's only a year and a half from now. It's only 18 months. Mm -hmm. Can any of these goals be accomplished reasonably in that amount of time? Well, we'll have to see. We don't really know how, how it's going to work. Uh, I, I think President Obama set this deadline to, poli to appease some people politically that we're not going to get into yet another protracted war that's really a distraction from our current economic problems. The more money we spend overseas for these wars, it's detracting from what we need to do to recover our own economy. And so we really don't know. Um, I think that most reasonable people, the fear is that if we leave too quickly, we could end up with something worse than what we had before. Uh, leave this power vacuum open. Um, that was the danger in Iraq. If we just simply leave after killing Saddam Hussein, although we didn't do it, but we captured him and turned him over to authorities, um, that that was going to suddenly solve the problem. And, and that's not what happened. Um, and so there is some effort to, to secure the country. So when we leave it, um, they will be able to work out their problems alone, handle their own security, and, and those type of things. Um, but it is very difficult. It is very difficult for us to try to, you know, this mythical time period. And, and I don't blame President Obama for, for saying this because I think setting a deadline says, look, guys, we're not going to be here forever, but we're here to assist you. But ultimately, it's going to be the Afghanistan people that are going to be responsible for their security and the kind of government that they have. Mm -hmm. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for your time today. I think we covered a lot of ground, and I appreciate you all taking time out of your schedules here, particularly at the end of the semester, to share your wisdom about Afghanistan. Enjoyed it. Uh, this is the final program in this fall's schedule. Inside Politics will return in late January with our coverage of the 106th Tennessee General Assembly with weekly visits from our area legislators. Please look for us in late January. And remember, you can log into our website, volstate.edu forward slash inside politics, for more information about our past guests and a link to viewing any of our archived programs.